Hi, welcome. I am here with a husband and wife team today, Jessica and Jeff Jennings. And I know you're probably thinking this is a podcast about divorce. So what am I doing with a husband and wife? But here's the thing. Jessica and Jeff are the co-founders of Relationship Remastery. They offer relationship coaching for couples. Jessica is a licensed professional counselor and Jeff has a PhD in counseling psychology. They met while getting their master's degrees and have been together for 19 years. So I'm thinking with all of their degrees and their own relationship success story, they probably know a thing or two about relationships. So welcome guys. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for having us. It's You're welcome. Great. Thank you so much. And Jeff, you're the first guy on the podcast, so no pressure, okay. but... <laughs> I, feel, I feel very honored. That's great. <laughs> I'll be nice. <laughs> so the statistics are clear, and they're kind of grim as to, you know, not only a first marriage, but a second marriage and then third marriage, they continuously get worse. So what's happening here? Right. Why are these second and third marriages, the statistics even higher than the first one? Yeah, that's a really great question. And that's an important question, you know, to figure out, right? Um, especially if you've gone through a divorce. Um, we, we use a quote by the poet Rumi, and he says, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Ooh, and yeah, it's a powerful quote. And it really sort of communicates this idea that you know, we've all built up barriers. We've all built up these self-protection strategies um, in our lives because we've been hurt, we've been injured. Um, and so we really need to figure out what that is for ourselves. Um, and if we don't do that, we sort of end up repeating the same patterns. So what we're not saying is, we're not saying that, you know, it's your fault that, you know, your marriage ended. Um, there are lots of reasons that marriage is in, oftentimes that are outside of one's control. But it's really important to understand your own barriers and blind spots so you're not repeating some of the same mistakes in the future. And the reason that it does become worse and worse is because our fear gets greater and then mm -hmm. we intensify the same patterns that don't work because we want it so desperately. We're mm -hmm. getting desperate and so our fear brain turns on and the truth is that we are born to love but we learn to fear and oftentimes in relationship when we haven't gotten our needs met we're really in that like mm -hmm. amygdala hijack where we're in that fight or flight so much of the time that it's really hard not to fight or run away and so we really work with couples on understanding that or individuals too who are seeking to stop this pattern mm -hmm. and seek really true healthy relationship that allows for deep introspection as well as deep connection with the person that you're in love with, that you're with, and that you're working towards making a relationship mm -hmm. work. And you just both said so many things and I have so many questions <laughs> from them. So the first is, um, Jessica, you said something about your needs had, aren't being met. How do you even identify what those needs are because I think so often people don't even know that their needs aren't being met. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that we recognize any time we are fighting that we need to slow that process down because we found in attachment research and in relationship research and cognitive neuroscience, the study of the brain, that any time we are experiencing a rejection, it hits us in the same exact place as physical pain hits us in the brain. So it's fascinating. We are experiencing these small rejections as painful, very, very painful. So that is an indication a need is not being met. So we mm -hmm. want to gently slow that down and say, hold on, hold on, what's going on here? And so I really, we work with couples understanding how this threat response system's activated and that we need to understand mm -hmm. and slow it down. And that's hard mm -hmm. to do. That's really hard to do because guess what? When you're afraid, your response is to protect yourself against a threat. Right. And that's another issue is that we're protecting ourselves against an unmet need. Mm -hmm. mm. 
And what if you have someone who is conflict aversion? You know, you, you know the, the couple that the one person is kind of the bigger voice, not necessarily a bully, but they're more vocal about that. And the other person sort of retreats. How does that person who retreats um, figure out how to use their voice so that that pattern doesn't exist in the next relationship? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's really important for couples to understand their cycle. Um, so, you know, if you've been, ever been in a relationship for, for any length of time, you probably realize that your arguments, or even if they're not arguments, even if it's like one person arguing and one person withdrawing, they start to take on a very, very predictable pattern, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can see it, mm -hmm. you know, it happens over and over again. So couples get into this cycle. Uh, different marriage writers call it different things, but a lot of times it's referred to as the dance, you know, something like that, you know, your own dance. But it's important to recognize what your cycle is and why you do the things that you do, why you retreat, you know, why um, you shut down. Um, and not, this is all sort of based in attachment research, and that's sort of what our specialty is and what we, how we work with couples is understanding how the needs were not met when you were younger and what you really needed in that moment. And then helping couples to, and individuals, to learn how to not only identify those needs, but also to be able to communicate them more effectively. Hmm. And what if someone who is doing this dance has a partner who's not willing to adjust their steps with them and it's only one person who wants to address it what does that person do well one of the things you can do is simply speak a softer emotion oftentimes what that will do is lower the threat level so instead mm -hmm. of saying um just really blaming shaming and name calling aggression mm -hmm. or withdrawing and shutting down and just completely silencing icing the person out for days so to speak what we can do is we can recognize our cycle we can say oh there i go again now mm -hmm. ideally the couple is going to say this oh my goodness here we are doing this mm -hmm. again we are in our threat response cycle i'm feeling threatened and i'm threatened but i'm also one of the two may be withdrawing the other may not be willing. And so when you recognize, oh, I'm withdrawing, it's very important and we have all kinds of worksheets and things like that to help people slow that down and identify what am I feeling right now? What do I need? And once you know that, and once you realize the person who's attacking you in this verbal way is actually scared too, you can say, I'm really scared right now because I want deeply to connect with you, but I don't know how. Mm -hmm. It seems like you don't want to, and that causes me tremendous pain and fear because I so long to connect. So instead of communicating, you're bad because you're yelling at me, you're communicating, I know we're both afraid and I want this so desperately, can we work together? Now, if the other person then at that point is willing, then you can verbalize what you've discovered you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the beauty of what we do with couples is that it works for, it does work for individuals too, you know, and it works for if only one person in the relationship is willing to do it. Because if one person in the relationship really gains that level of insight and awareness into their own patterns, into what's going on in the relationship, and they make a concerted effort to change that for themselves, it's going to change the dynamic. It's going right, to change right. the cycle, you know, by default. So. And I have experience where couples, um, one of the two does try this and the other is so entrenched or so wounded that it doesn't work very well. Um, and it can work to a certain degree because like um, Jeff said, you cannot you know, change without the other person having to do some change. But sometimes it does make it worse than it, it, particularly abusive relationships. And that's mm -hmm. a time yeah. to seek help and to, to set stronger boundaries or get out. So this is not, Again, a yeah. shame on you for not trying this sooner. It's just, yeah. we're all in this journey together. And yes, we do influence each other, but there are times when if both aren't willing to do the work at some point, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle. Yeah, that's a very important thing to, to note there too, is just, yeah, if there is um, abuse going on in a relationship mm -hmm. or something like that, then other steps need to be taken, you know. What, sure. about, what about mental illness? Because often that is sort of the yes. root of a breakdown of a marriage. What is it? Does it mean all hope is lost in that relationship? 
Absolutely not. Definitely not. not. Yeah, it, it, it obviously is going to depend to some degree on the nature of the mental illness and what's going on. It's going to depend to some degree on that person's willingness to seek help for their own mental health issues. Um, but that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that this can't work or there's no hope. There's certainly hope. There's lots of people with mental illnesses that have really good relationships and good marriages, um, even severe mental, you know, even in some cases, severe mental illness. So um, I think it's very possible, but it's going to vary, you know, person to person. And I think two things to think about is one, if you have severe depression or any kind of mental health issue, anxiety or bipolar, that you get the help you need individually. Mm -hmm. That's obvious, but sometimes overlooked. The second mm -hmm. thing is that the person who is, you know, loving you and in that relationship with you gets that education about how to be compassionate, understanding and supportive. Because guess what? Intimacy is not about two perfect people journeying together. It's two imperfect people willing to slow down their process and know the other person to this point of being able to love them well mm -hmm. in compassion and sacrifice. And so that's perfect mm -hmm. love, you know, and that's what casts out this mm -hmm. fear. So whether I have severe depression or whether I'm just going through a depression because I've lost something special to me, if I have a spouse who's willing to slow down and grieve with me, I will heal and I will form a bond with them. They will help me form this bond together. We will be so bonded that it will actually enhance the beauty of our relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it helps us take on these severe concerns mm -hmm. in our life or even mental health disorders and turn them into superpowers. And that's part of what we're doing is we're helping people understand that even their threat response system is an indication they need something more. And when you get what you need, you're stronger and you're stronger mm -hmm. in that relationship of bonding and safety together. Mm -hmm. And there are actually support groups, oh, right, for some mental illness for, for family members and relatives Absolutely. and Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a great oh, thing yeah. to do is to get involved with a community of people who understand what you're going through, mm -hmm. what your spouse is going through, and, mm -hmm. and to be able to get those amazing pointers and tips. Because mm -hmm. if we have the information, we know, hey, what's happening is so normal. And all we need to do then is go back to the psychiatrist and get the mm -hmm. meds adjusted. Or right. you know, instead of panicking and maybe creating more of a, a problem by rejecting our our partner saying, you're not doing mm -hmm. what you need to be doing. Say, no, this is normal. There's ups and downs with depression or bipolar. What we need to do mm -hmm. is go get more help, adjustment of meds, and then we'll be back on track. Yeah. You know, so it's very helpful to have that community. Yeah. Right. And it, it's true for, for anything. So there are really sort of like four major energy exits to a relationship, you know, so mental illness is one, can be one of them, um, having an extramarital marital yeah. affair is another one if there's any kind of domestic violence or abuse um or major substance abuse you know so right. those are really sort of four big areas where there's something more that needs to be addressed than just the relationship itself so what if there is betrayal can a relationship recover from that and how does the couple the the spouse that was cheated on ever trust again yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've definitely have, have worked with couples where affairs have been a part of that work um, and we've seen couples recover from that. And so certainly couples who are willing to do the work and really are willing to risk, you know, again, can, can work through that um, and even have a better relationship, you know, as they really unpack some of the things we've talked about unpack what their true needs are, unpack what those barriers have been to really getting in those needs met in the relationship, which led one or both, you know, to seek those needs outside of the relationship. When they understand those needs and understand how to communicate them and know how they can get them met, they can have a better relationship than they had even before the affair. You know, it takes time though, you know, okay. it, it takes work. Um, and it takes time to, to, to be able to trust again and to work through, you know, forgiveness and things like that, you know, when someone's been deeply hurt. Right. Okay. So we talked about all of the, the reasons why marriages break down, but now let's talk about what couples can do right now in order to strengthen their relationship and build their bond. 
That's a great question. I think that being intentional in this mm -hmm. season, especially when there's some of us, there's more time, not everyone has more time on their hands, but intentional awakening, because unless we are able to truly see the person that's in front of us, unless we reawaken to the small things and are able to take the mm -hmm. time to connect um, with the one that we love, to, to really see them in their joys, but also in their hurts and pain, it's going to be hard. Um, and then we want to just as we reawaken, we want to rediscover each other in mm -hmm. exciting ways. So we encourage in our um, work with couples then to go back and to talk about what first attracted you to the other person. How do we look at what, mm -hmm. what we do truly cherish and love about the person that's sitting right there with us? Because how often do we look at someone and don't see them? Or do we yeah. listen to someone and don't hear them? Um, and do we love someone, but we don't feel that in our hearts? And part of that is because we're not reawakening or rediscovering. And then we can mm -hmm. reconnect because mm -hmm. this is the beauty of it. It's that when we're not in fear, when we're not afraid of being misunderstood or, um, or hurt, we can truly show our true selves and mm -hmm. show up fully in the relationship. Yeah, and that's one of the things we really make a point in our work with couples is to make sure they're having these what we call reconnection conversations where they're really talking through, they're sitting down and they're talking through the things that they're learning about themselves, about each other. They're being vulnerable with each other. Um, that is really key to building that kind of intimacy and bond that you really want. You know, you have to be willing to sort of be vulnerable. And we experience that in our own relationship, you yeah, know. That's um, a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is very tough, you know, and, you know, um, even just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a little, you know, a little misunderstanding and, uh, and you know, like I realized what was going on for me, but I also realized at the same time that like, I didn't want to share it. You know, there was a part of me that was like, oh, I don't want to really tell her this. Um, so we have to be willing to make ourselves vulnerable. And that is really key um, to building that, that emotional bond. And what we have to remember is that if we're willing to do that, as hard as it can be, that there is such beauty, there is such connection in store as we restore that bond, as we take care of each other and renew that bond, that we can wind deeper and tighter together. And that's the beauty mm. of long-term relationship is that that intimacy doesn't just go away. It can actually be deepened and it can be ever more beautiful as we wind tighter into sharing who we are mm -hmm. and and really honoring the other person in in seeing who they are and mm -hmm. i just think that's that's really powerful yeah it, is it a process because your words sound so perfect and beautiful and i'm like oh yes yes i want to <laughs> do that but i i'm kind of picturing like a couple who has for years not done any of that and they haven't yeah. heard each other or seen each other and what does that process right. look like for a couple who's sort of just complacent uh-huh yeah that's a great question it really i mean it is a process right um and but it's a process that doesn't necessarily have to take a long time yeah. and the, one of the things you know one of the limitations we've seen in sort of traditional counseling um especially when working with couples is it's often one too little too late right mm -hmm. they, they they wait too long to come to counseling you know the problems have built up over years and years and years and there's a lot of work that needs to be done um and one of the other limitations of counseling is that it doesn't really allow you to address the individual needs as well as the needs of the couple and so that process can take a lot longer in that kind of traditional setting and if one or both people are kind of done, you know, or mm -hmm. on the fence and they don't have the patience, you know, to really stick, see it through, they quit, you know, they, they end up terminating counseling early. Um, and they say, you know, they say, well, I gave it a try, you know, it just, it just wasn't working out. But really, oftentimes it's a matter that the process is taking too long or they've waited too long. Mm. And uh, is there a good time when someone should start marriage counseling i mean i feel like often people go when it is too late should they get ahead of it and start when there aren't any problems or should they wait for like the first you know sign of of something yeah well that's where i think 
we love the idea of premarital counseling. Like we have mm -hmm. offered that. And I think that prevention is so much better when you can do it. An ounce of prevention is yeah. better than like a pound of cure. Yes. You know, sort of thing. And yeah. so I agree that if we can implement these these things early on if we can reawaken to these patterns you know as we're doing them early on uh, that's best but i think that i think that it's about doing it right in this moment it's saying wherever i am it is never too late mm -hmm. and it's never too early um mm -hmm. you can learn these things as you're single if you've never been married if you're divorced mm -hmm. if you're currently married and unhappy if you're married and totally happy because the reality of it is that we all can awaken further to the mm -hmm. unconscious patterns of fear that are that are standing in the way of deeper intimacy and so this is the thing to remember for all of us is that we are born for this we are born to connect and we long for it and the person mm -hmm. that's sitting across from you or next to you um, in this life and relationship that that person wants this desperately too and mm -hmm. that the heart and the cry that we all have is you know see me know me love me and at the mm -hmm. end of the day there are um tools and skills and this new knowledge we have of relationship research and cognitive neuroscience that give us back the power to write our love story is as one that doesn't have um, an unhappy ending that has a connected mm -hmm. and very very happy ending because we can choose to do these things at any point in our relationship mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. the, the simple answer is this the sooner the better <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, a lot of couples, you know, they kind of, you know, one of the mistakes I think couples make is that, you know, they figure, you know, they figure they can just do it on their own, you know, or they kind of, right. you know, they recognize that something is a little off, but, you know, they just kind of keep trudging along. You know, we worked with a couple recently and they were a little bit younger. They had a, a small child, like a two-year-old. Um, and they, we, they were very proactive, you know, they recognized that there were some patterns in their relationship. You know, the relationship wasn't horrible, um, good. but it was actually in a pretty good place. And one of the funny things that they said, you know, we asked them like, well, if you don't fix this issue, you know, what do you imagine is going to happen? And, you know, the husband said, well, we'll probably just, you know, kind of hobble along until we die, you know, <laughs> basically, but it was that idea that, you know, well, we'll just like, you know, we'll just be on crutches, you know, for the rest of our lives, but we're going to stay together, which yeah. actually was kind of endearing to his wife that he said Yeah, that. Right. Well, we want um, people to be running free. Like right. we want people to really grasp the possibility that is there, that, that each one of us has this yeah. possibility to create this kind of love in our lives and relationships. And that's the power we want to be able to hand over to, to couples. And like I said, now is the time. This is the moment, regardless of where you are, if you're feeling a sense of disconnection or unrest, deal with it. Deal with those small kernels. Mm -hmm. um, because if we, if we sow those kinds of fears into a relationship, it is harder later on, but mm -hmm. it's never impossible. Because mm -hmm. again, we are born to love, we learn to fear, but guess what? Neuroscience is telling us our yeah. brain has neuroplasticity. We can learn mm -hmm. to love again. And that's mm -hmm. the power that's coming out of this research and that we're so excited yeah. about because we can do something different. We're not just um, stuck and doomed. Yeah. It's not just fate. You know, you didn't just choose the wrong person. That This is about choosing to be the type of yeah. person. Or you're not incapable of yeah. love, you know, people sometimes. We tell people, ourselves you know, these tell, lies, tell ourselves you know. Lies. Part just, of the mindset thing, having to change, you know, the lies that we speak to ourselves, yeah. the things that we say to ourselves, Absolutely. you know, well, I'm just not cut out for a relationship. Mm -hmm. or I'm not cut out for marriage. Or I'm not, you know, I can't deeply connect with other people. So, um, yeah, and just, you can. Yeah. The answer is yeah. That's how you feel. I validate that. It's such a terrible feeling, but you're made for this. You can, mm -hmm. and but you do need help. We all do. And that that's such a great message because I think so many people who are going through divorce at the end of it, they feel unlovable. You know, mm -hmm. they're not, and they'll oh, yeah. never, they'll <laughs> never love again. They'll never be in another relationship. No one will ever love them again. Right. Because it's so painful. Again, rejection, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, hits us in the same place as physical pain. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing is when we go to the emergency room because we've, you know, gotten a snake bite, they have a protocol for that. Mm -hmm. But there's not a protocol oftentimes, even when you go to therapy, there's not a written, succinct, 
start to finish protocol of how to heal. And that's one of the things we've helped to create and um, put mm. into place is, is it's a protocol from the research that really does help to heal mm -hmm. from the inside out and yeah. in a way that allows you to be empowered to move forward in your love life and your relationship. So how does someone know when they're ready to start putting themselves out there again? Because often we see people mm -hmm. start dating too soon, sometimes during right. the divorce, which usually doesn't end well. Um, and then mm -hmm. you have other people who say, I'll never date again or ever get married again. And so how do you know when you're ready? Yeah, it's such an, I mean, I think that's such an it's individual thing. Yeah. Um, but I think all people, you know, I, I am of the opinion um, that all people should really spend some time doing some self work, you know, one, you know, if you've gone through a divorce, you need to heal, you know, it's gonna, you just need to heal yourself. That's a, one of the most stressful, hardest things a person will go through in this lifetime you know? Um, so you need to take time to heal. Um, you need to take some time to really understand what happened, um, what went wrong and, and take some time to really sort of reflect on, you know, again, your own barriers, you know, and making sure you are gaining some insight and awareness and understanding of, you know, even if you know you had a horrible spouse and it was a horrible situation outside of your control, you know you can still take time to understand. You know what what did I contribute? Is there something I contributed? What do I need to do differently? You know, in in the future as far as choosing a spouse, you know, yeah. um, or you know what do I need to do in my communication? So just really taking time to know yourself um, and heal you know, from that, from the damage, um, before you sort of jump in to another relationship. And that is going to vary widely, you know, how, how long that process needs to take for different right, right. people. Um, yeah. If it, some, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, but I think that's where you, if you are, you know, in a coaching situation or in therapy, that's where someone else can also be a wise guide mm, for you. Yeah. Um, because we tend to the all or nothing, which is we hop right into it, or we say we'll never do it again. And we want to do this, this transcendent both and, which is believing we're lovable and recognizing we still need to change, that we're loved just as we are and we must change something. And so that's where a therapist or someone outside can help us determine with mm -hmm. our own genuine understanding of our healing to say, I'm ready, I'm ready mm -hmm. to do this. And that therapist say, you know what, I think you're right. Or you know what, let's look at this. And that gives us a little bit more of an internal mm -hmm. awareness so that we can determine what's best for us as we move forward rather than just, you know, waiting six months or a year or something. Right, so, right. And if someone's in a relationship right now, what's one thing they can do today um, to help their relationship in a positive way? I love that question. Um, we have this on our Facebook page. It's one of my favorites. It's called Love is in the Air. And so it's about making love tangible. It's about mm. setting aside even just 15, 20 minutes and remembering three things from mm. way back when. So maybe get out some pictures of your first date or mm -hmm. um, think about even what you were wearing or what you remember. Like I remember seeing him for the first time um, mm. in the parking lot of our graduate school thinking, who is he? Like I just, <laughs> I didn't know. I just remember that. And so talking about your first date, what does that do? It actually it actually promotes this experience of oxytocin in our physical bodies, which mm -hmm. promotes bonding. When we remember, mm -hmm. and we remember these fond memories of being attracted to each other, it really does cause us yeah. to feel in our physical bodies a fondness and a drawing toward the other person. It doesn't have to take long. And I encourage people, when you go on a date, do that. Look back at times that you guys had fun together or that you appreciated the other person. So these are things that we can do every day, but yeah. when we do them, set aside that time, put your phones away, look each yeah. other in the eye, really be intentional and genuine mm -hmm. and feel the love just kind of rising in you and remembering yeah. what brought you together. You can do, any one of us in a, in a relationship can do that today. Yeah, and that's a really great practice because it generates positive emotions. And so many times when a relationship is not doing well, there's so much negative sentiment or what, and what happens is what John Gottman calls negative sentiment override. So the negative actually sort of 
overshadows anything positive in the relationship. And you actually need about a four to one ratio, Gottman says. You need four positives to every one negative, mm. actually, to have a healthy relationship. Um, so even an even ratio is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> um, so it's that can really generate that positive emotion by just like remembering, you know, when you fell in love, when you started dating, you know, talking about your first dates, things like that can uh, get those positive feelings flowing. That, that's great. So you two work as a team, right? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you explain a little bit just your process and how you're doing this virtually now? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as Jessica mentioned, um, you know, with traditional counseling, there's often not sort of like a system, you know, a step by step process. And we created a, a protocol, relate, the Relationship Remastery and Connection Protocol, where we take couples on a very, it's an eight week journey, you know, it is. Um, and we can do this with individuals too, where um, each week, sort of, they, they have course material that they're going through, they have specific exercises that they're doing. And then we're meeting with them both individually to address the individual needs. So I'm meeting oftentimes um, with the husband and Jessica's oftentimes meeting with the wife, you know, individually. And then we're meeting with them together as a couple, you know, doing the coaching piece with them together as a couple as they're sort of going through the material. So it's pretty intensive, um, but it is, it's intensive for a reason. One, you get results, faster, you know, so that helps mm -hmm. with that. It's where couples oftentimes sort of lose hope, you know, or if things aren't moving quick enough, they, they decide to terminate therapy. So it's an intensive by design. And the great thing about the virtual part of it is you can do it from anywhere. You can do it from home. You don't have to travel to this sort of intensive retreat, you know, do this like week long, you know, marriage retreat. Um, and then you're back home sort of on your own again and trying to figure out how to apply it. You're actually at home going through the material and as things come up, you know, we're there to sort of like coach you and help you with that. So you know how to apply it in real life. And so how do we find you online? Yeah, right now, um, the best way to connect with us is through our, our Facebook page um, or our Facebook, we have a private group. So if you go to the page, you can click on learn more, it'll take you to our group and you can ask to join the group, answer a couple of questions, and then you know we'll, we'll let you into the group. Um, in our group, we post sort of weekly challenges and um, communication tips, things like that, you know, for, for couples and for individuals. Um, and that's the best way to con connect with us right now. We're revamping our website. So it's sort of, it's down at the moment. Um, but the Facebook group is a really great way to connect with us and also get some, some good tips in along the way. Yep. And we're having a five day challenge coming up. So if anybody is in that place where they just want a little mm -hmm. bit more to understand, okay, how do I stop the cycle? It's going to be a five day challenge about reawakening to your own pattern and your mm -hmm. own cycle. And that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So you guys um, come on and join us. That'll mm -hmm. be a free challenge that yep. just will educate and help encourage couples. Thank you so much. The link for Facebook will be in the show notes. And thank you. Uh, you both are doing such important work. So thank you for being here and sharing all of your wisdom and uh, experience with us. Thank you for having us. And I appreciate the work you're doing as well. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.